collection and retention panel, you're in the right place. If you're looking for something else, you should stay anyway. Uh, <laughs> my name's Eric Sinrod. I'm with Dwayne Morris. I'll be moderating this panel. I'm delighted we actually have only two other members of this panel, so I think it'll give them a better chance to express their views instead of having an army of people here. Our goal today is to present some information to you. Um, if you have questions along the way, we absolutely welcome them. You don't have to wait until the end. You know, I we're mean, playing you to you. We're the, you're the violin we're trying to play. So uh, hopefully we'll present relevant information. And if you want to know something that we're not directly touching on, uh, do let us know. So like I said, my name is Eric Sinrod. I'm with Dwayne Morris. Um, I'll let my co-panelists introduce themselves, and then I'll start moving through the topics. Yeah, my name is Jim Snell. I'm a partner at Perkins Coie in Palo Alto. I counsel and litigate IP and privacy issues, and primarily on the uh, privacy side, specialty of class action defense, um, particularly where statutory damages are alleged uh, due data breach responses. On the IP side, trade secret, copyright, and patent cases. And um, apologies for overlapping with the US World Cup game uh, today. I hope the US is still winning. And we'll find out. Uh, one thing about this conference that I really like is it, it is best practices. And so one of the things we talked about is trying to identify when we hit a topic, if we have a best practice to, to leave it out there so you have a list of tools to go back with. Thank you. Andrew? Andy Sherwin. I'm a partner at uh, Morrison and Forrester's uh, San Diego office in the data privacy arena. Uh, I do both uh, the regulatory side as well, so including data breach response counseling on data use uh, and retention, but also the enforcement side from the Federal Trade Commission, with the Federal Trade Commission Office of Civil Rights, the state AGs, as well as the private uh, class action litigation as well. Well, I didn't mention, my practice is actually quite similar to Jim's, and I write a weekly cyber law blog for fine law. If that's of interest to you, feel free to send me an email and I'll get you on the list. Uh, my email should be in the biographical materials. So the first topic we wanted to talk about, and we're delighted more people are coming in, please join, um, is what, what, what uh, data should a company retain versus what data must a company retain? So Andy, why don't you kick that one off for us? Sure. Um, and so you get into uh, areas, HIPAA is an example, uh, major public uh, telcos are another example, financial institutions. Um, all have data retention obligations in the sense that they have to keep data for a certain period of time. Sometimes that's set by statute, sometimes it's sort of a best practice, but there are a variety of times where it's simply not possible to say, you know, we'd like to get rid of this data and we're just going to get rid of it in 30 days. The, the flip side of that is there's about 35 states that have either data destruction or data retention, uh, restrictions on data retention on the other side of it. So you've got to try to, when you do a program, um, these are definitely not one-size-fits-all type approaches. It really depends on the industry you're in, the states you operate in. Frankly, we'll talk a little bit about, um, obviously, global issues a little later, but you've got to try to balance this out. So when I deal, for example, and it's, it's an issue that is becoming much more relevant for technology companies, HIPAA has become the sort of the new, the new law that everyone is having to deal with as a business associate now. And so there are very specific uh, you know, records retention. Michigan, if you have medical records, you have to keep them for a minimum of seven years. You cannot get rid of them. And so there, part of understanding this issue is to understand that it's unfortunately not a black or white issue where you can simply say, our data retention policy is we get rid of it in X period of time. There's some litigation pieces we can touch on later as well, where having the data itself might actually help you as a defense in litigation. And so you've got to balance out the risk profile here of, of what you're keeping uh, versus what you're getting rid of. And the, the downside of keeping it, obviously, is the longer you keep it, the more chance you have for a data breach, depending on the data set. And you also have more laws that apply to your business if you're keeping certain forms of data long term. Jim? Yeah, so um, t just taking a 10,000 foot level approach, one sort of best practice is to, is to use a need-based um, approach where you retain what you really need with appropriate security measures based on you know, how uh, sensitive that data is, but also minimizing the retention of things that you don't need. And this runs counter to um, a lot of companies' mindsets. It's very easy to collect data. It's very easy to store it now. It's very easy to keep it. And it requires thought to decide, you know, what do I need um, to really serve the customer and, and what can I get rid of so I don't have to either produce it in e-discovery or, 
produce it in response to a warrant or suffer a data breach and, and have, that, um, have that data go missing. And so, you know, the common example is, well, we collect credit card data. You know, well, do you really need all the numbers of the credit card or can you just use the last four digits to do a confirmation of, of the transaction? Um, again, if you keep less, it's generally better. One of the things that we hear and one of the interesting areas of privacy law that's developing now, I think, is big data and analytics. And there's a notion that, you know, I really need to keep everything because my competitors are keeping everything and I don't know what analytics are going to be available tomorrow that I might run on that data and, you know, to, to keep a competitive advantage, uh, you know, I really want to collect everything. And I would um, think carefully about that approach and, and counsel against it in most instances. Most businesses don't need to keep everything, even if you're going to run analytics, I think you can identify the, uh, the data that you want to keep to do that on. And the other thing I'd say sort of on the data collection front is um, there's resources available like the FCC consent decrees are a good place, I think, to look at for general guidance, um, guidelines that you might follow, the NIST security framework um, for data security issues. And those places are good resources to turn to, um, not as requirements, but um, you know, if you're defending a policy to a regulator later on and you say, well, we looked at these things. Um, that can be helpful. And then sort of a related topic here, um, I think it's a best practice to have a data creation policy. And by that I mean, um, you know, guidance for employees on when and how to create data. So uh, if a communication might be one um, that you might not want to have shared with others later, think about looping in an attorney in a privilege context. This is particularly important with litigation holds. Um, I've had cases where I found um, uncomfortable documents in defending a case and also found documents in prosecuting a case. Um, uh, there was a case a couple years ago where um, some employees of the defendant who we had sued were talking in a text and one of the employees said, hey, the complaint says that we did X. And the other employee says, well, we do do X. You know, and that was something and the texts weren't produced right away. It was something that came out later in discovery through a motion to compel. And that, you know, you wave that stuff around to a jury, um, it, it can be quite persuasive. And if you're defending it, it can be quite hard to deal with. So uh, with every litigation hold that I have a client send out, there's some things, there's some guidance, you know. Don't talk about, a pin, don't um, talk as little as possible about this case. If you need to talk about it, can you involve an attorney? Um, don't express opinions, right? Express facts if we need to talk about the case. And to educate with some of those examples, some of those worst case examples, um, it doesn't, you know, this isn't a policy that gets buried somewhere. It's, it's some commonplace guidance that I think helps people um, to avoid creating something that can be quite damaging later on. So you're starting to touch on some litigation matters, and we've been hearing a lot about statutory claims. So Jim, why don't you lead off with a discussion of that and also help provide some guidance, if you can, on how companies can avoid such claims if possible. And before you do that, just before I forget, as a matter of housekeeping, we've been asked to tell you that you know, if you love these guys, please make sure you fill out the online evaluations. If you don't, you can forget about it. But, but seriously, why don't you start off with statutory claims, if you don't mind? Yeah, so there's two primary areas of risk with data collection. And the first, which is the most popular right now, probably is statutory. Um, causes of action, statutes that have a private right of action and statutory damages. And so to take an example, the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, right? If you're collecting somebody's phone number and you're going to use that phone number to either send a text um, or make a call with an auto dialer, which is um, the definition right now is very broad. It's anything that has the capacity to auto dial is the general holding um, that the FCC has cited. Uh, there's um, there's been a, a real mushrooming in claims in the last year to two years. We see probably um, five to 10 cases filed uh, around the US every week right now. And uh, the statute was amended last fall to require prior express written consent before you um, send a text to a consumer using an auto dialer or a call using an artificial or pre-recorded voice or an auto dialer. And um, again, there's a lot of ambiguity. Prior express written consent means you have a written signed agreement 
with the consumer. That can be done through a web form. It can be done through um, a text or, a, or a, a key press on a phone call, but there's um, certain requirements you need to meet the eSign Act. Another statutory claim that we see is the California Invasion of Privacy Act right now, and this is the statute that prohibits the recording of calls without the consent of both parties. The damages are $5,000 per call, and there's a lot of businesses that uh, do business outside of California, call folks in, in California, and the plaintiff's lawyers have been going crazy with this claim as well. There's been hundreds of cases filed and even more cases threatened through sort of holdups of companies to try to get a, a settlement. Um, the statute was never intended to cover uh, call recording to do service observing to make sure employees aren't lying to customers, which is actually a pro-consumer use. But the exception that was cooked into the statute back in 1967 doesn't really apply anymore because it says if you get your call recording equipment pursuant to a tariff of a public utility, you're exempt. So the plaintiff's lawyers have been filing suits against businesses. Folks always say, well, why don't you just have the disclaimer on the call that says this call may be recorded or monitored. And um, first of all, not every business around the U.S. knows that knows about California's specific law, but also the plaintiff's lawyers are ex super creative. So they, they might call somebody and when a call is gonna be referred to somebody else, you know, they'll then file a lawsuit just on the exchange of pleasantries. Can I speak to Mr. Smith? Well, Mr. Smith isn't here right now. When you got to Mr. Smith, you were gonna give the call recording disclaimer, but they weren't there, so then the, the secretary, administrative assistant who gets the call will sue. Um, they'll check to make sure the English line has the same disclaimer as the Hispanic line. If it doesn't, you know, they'll file a lawsuit. So it's, it's not a very simple matter. It's one where um, the, there's been $18 million class action settlements. So as far as data collection on call recording, it's a good place to look. The Fair Credit Reporting Act is another um, statute that has a private right of action and statutory damages. The Video Privacy Protection Act, um, those are, are uh, just a few of the statutes. There's a list of um, statutes with these types of claims that I put in, a, in an article that if folks want to see, you can email me and I'll, I'll send you a copy of the article. The other place where I think there's a rise in claims is with respect to misrepresentations, claim misrepresentations. And one of the things we'll talk about in, in more detail is really making sure that your representations match um, what the business is doing. Because um, plaintiffs are having a really hard time in class actions about data collection proving injury, proving standing in federal court. And uh, when you're able to prove a misrepresentation, that's a place where the courts have been allowing those cases to Andy? Yeah, and let me pick up on uh, on our wonderful state law out here, the uh, SIPA. One just sort of best practice, I've actually had cases with uh, what I'll call the uh, hit zero feature. So your call recording will work, uh, the disclaimer will work, but if you hit zero to ask to speak to an operator before you get to a live person, sometimes they don't play recordings, and I've had a couple of cases. So if you do have these systems, you do want to go through yourself and test out and zero through or you know, hit operator to see if it actually plays the recording. Most of them do, some of them don't. Um, and to, to Jim's earlier point about the settlements, I mean, I had one where we had 250,000 calls, which was like a billion two in potential damages if you do the do the math. And they don't settle for that, obviously, but they We'll are, give you half. Yeah, exactly, half, a bargain at any price. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, that's the scary part of these cases. They don't, you know, they usually are cases that settle in the, you know, Jim, I, don't, I, I see them in the, like the five million. I mean, they're smaller ones, but the, the biggest I've sort of seen other than the 18 was like a $10 million one, but it's where this exposure is just so massive that you just have to say, okay, we've got to get rid of this even if we think it's a ridiculous case. So uh, definitely one to watch out for. There's. Um, California, you don't see them in other states in class actions. Um, other states do have them. There's 11 other states that have these laws. And if you remember um, the ACORN uh, situation a few years ago where they videotape people, uh, they tried to use Maryland's two-party consent law for a videotape, um, a person-to-person -person communication. So these laws are very strangely worded, so they apply to any confidential communication. And California has two prongs. But confidential communication can be on the phone. It can be in person in some of these, so just something to watch out for um, overall because this, the damages are very heavy. From a data breach perspective, what we're seeing, uh, and, and Jim hit it right on, which is it's standing 
um, and that has been the fight for years, which is you can't prove sufficient damage to show Article Three standing. What we've seen recently, I'd say, is a little bit of a shift. So um, that used to get fought out at the motion to dismiss stage. So you'd file your 12B6 or a demur in California state court and win it, take it up on appeal, and hopefully get affirmed. Now we're seeing that play out at summary judgment more often than not. So the plaintiffs will have the ability to allege something that is sufficient to get past the, the first wave of pleading motions. Um, where I've seen it now going, unfortunately, is class cert. So even if you can't prove that the main plaintiff doesn't have actual damage, what's happening is courts are now starting to say, well, even if there is some damage for some people, um, there's no commonality of damage, so therefore there's no class certification. So you can win on the same issue one of three different ways, and what we're, you know, what we're seeing really in the data breach litigation space is some courts are pushing this analysis later and later than litigation, unfortunately, which does raise the stakes from a cost perspective at least, and perhaps give more incentive to try to settle. Good. Jim, your misrepresentation point takes me back to a time when companies were first getting on the internet and they would talk to me about having, wanting to have the best policy in terms of privacy that they could post. And they would get into the biggest trouble when they would put up sort of this platinum privacy policy that would offer the greatest protections imaginable, but then they wouldn't follow through in practice. And that's where we, they would get in trouble. So we'll get to misrepresentation in a moment. Um, data obviously doesn't stay you know, here only in the United States. We, we need to go global. Uh, before we do that, let me just take the temperature of the group. Are there any questions at this point before we go forward? All right, Jim, let's go global. All right, there's two things I wanted to talk about with respect to um, global issues, and one is international e-discovery. In the last couple of months, I've dealt with both the European Commission trying to get documents from a U.S. server um, that belonged to a U.S. company and arguing that no privilege applied to those documents. And I've also dealt with a case in a civil litigation with um, a litigant trying to get um, documents overseas and, in litigation. And there was a recent report about a Microsoft order. This was a warrant under the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, the Stored Communications Act. And the judge in that case held that the Stored Communications Act a warrant would allow um, the government to get from Microsoft email information that was held on a Microsoft subsidiary server in Dublin, Ireland. And this case uh, has been appealed. Um, Verizon just submitted an amicus brief, I think, yesterday um, or, or Friday in the case. And this is an area where we continue to see developments. I was actually talking to the Irish Data Commissioner, Billy Hawks, during a break. I figured I have him here. I'll ask him about this <laughs> Dublin makes, issue yeah. and, and Microsoft. And he said, you know, it's a really, really hard issue. And from his standpoint, you know, if you're, if you're in Ireland and you're going after a company who does business in Ireland, you, know, you have an issue of geographic control. Do I have geographic jurisdiction over the company um, that I'm going after? And do they have possession, custody, and control over the documents that I want? And so the issue about you know, extraterritoriality versus possession, custody, or control is one that is becoming um, increasingly difficult to solve. And with cloud computing, it's even more difficult. Uh, Billy Hawks told me that the Irish Data Protection Agency has specifically not taken a position on the Microsoft order because the issues there are, are so complicated. So a best practice I would suggest is to think through you know, the way that your business works and what international aspects of your business you might be facing in terms of um, enforcers asking for documents or private litigants asking for documents. And for example, should you have uh, email of subsidiary companies commingled in, some, in the same place? Is there a way to shut off technical access to documents so that if the EC comes in on a Don raid and asks for all your documents in the US, you can truthfully tell them, I don't have possession, custody, or control over that. You have to talk to our US parent. And so that's an area where I think with a little bit of thought, you can really um, do, some, um, do some useful, take some useful steps to protect that information. The other thing that this raises is issues of attorney-client privilege. In the European Commission issue I had, um, the European Commission was basically arguing, well, we can get documents between in-house counsel 
and the in-house business folks because there is no there is no privilege recognized in the European Union between in-house counsel and the business. This is a scary issue, right? And I think as a best practice, you ought to think through, you know, do we need to have outside counsel engaged here? Is there a way to shield um, from production in-house communications with the in-house business folks? Again, this might be part of your data creation policy. We want to advise our in-house counsel uh, that there may not be a privilege that's recognized outside the US when there's communications with the business folks. So be careful about what you say, particularly in like the antitrust as aspects. That's an area where uh, I think, um, you know, foreign governments would be likely to find there's no privilege. On the flip side, we've had some success. You know, there's this tension that in the EU, there's much less discovery than is allowed in the US. And so it's not surprising that there hasn't been a rich privilege law developed in the EU, whereas where there's a lot of discovery in the US, we have had this rich privilege law developed. And we've made arguments in courts that have been successful to say because there's no privilege or because there's no discovery in the EU, they don't recognize privilege. If you're gonna you know, have a US, uh, if you're gonna have uh, documents produced in the US that weren't subject to privilege, because there's discovery here, we ought to read a privilege into those documents and, and been able to protect documents that way. And has that argument been successful? Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So thinking through those privilege issues and making sure that you're, you're not creating documents that may, be, that may see the light of the day in a way you, you don't want them to. So much to cover here, but Andy, I know you have more to contribute. Sure, uh, I think one of the things, I'll, I'll pick up that last point first is, uh, when we deal with this in the US, uh, and particularly I'd say when, when I've dealt with this in the context of hiring consultant, let's say you've either had a data breach or you wanna see what your systems look like uh, before you have a breach and you wanna bring in a third party to look at that, what, um, there's a variety of different ways those reports can become <clears throat> relevant. Obviously, if you're in litigation, they can be the roadmap for the plaintiff. <coughs> If you're dealing with our friends at the Federal Trade Commission, the end result of that is a 20-year consent decree where you have a third-party assessor come in and, and look at your data security and say it's either reasonable or it's not. And part of what they look at is what reports have you done, what risk assessments have you done. And so you have this fight with the third-party assessor over if you've had a, a different third-party come in and assess your systems, do they get that report? And so when we've had real concern about it from uh, even in the U.S., what we will do is, uh, we as the outside lawyers will hire the consultant directly. Um, the documents all flow through us, and then there's times where, frankly, those documents may not even be communicated in written form to our client, because work product is, is in, the, in a very strange way, but it's owned by the lawyer, not necessarily the company, and so the argument you would make, similar to what Microsoft tried to make, is, it's not in the company's possession, custody, or control if it sits with me and it's never been sent to them. And so it's one thing, just in addition, I'd say over here is to think about if you're going to get a roadmap of your data security systems done for whatever reason, think through who should be hiring those consultants, how that information gets communicated over, because there are times where you'll have a, whether it's a PCI obligation or other obligations that may sort of cut into that privilege and give people a bunch of information you don't want out. To, I'm going to sort of hit on the cloud issues and, and it'll bleed into the Microsoft case because it is a, um, it's a very interesting one and the Irish Data Protection Authority is the one of the few that came out with the Snowden situation and said, yep, Safe Harbor permits it and, you know, we're, we're good to go with this basically. So it will be interesting to see where they kind of come out ultimately on, on the Microsoft issue. But ECPA is a mess. Uh, everyone talks about how uh, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act needs to be reformed. The challenge is it's a law from the 60s that was applied to telephones and these distinctions that we draw uh, really are, are ones based on timing that might sort of make sense with phones but don't really make sense with technology. And Title I, you'll hear people talk about it, is the Wiretap Act. It applies to a real-time communication. So if someone records me talking right now live, um, if I were on a phone, that's a wiretap. Stored communications are exactly what you'd think they'd be, which is something that is stored. It's not real-time. That works reasonably well with phones. It does not work at all with email because one of the first fights that, it were, that was had under ECPA is when is an email in storage? Um, there's a case called Councilman that says it's, it's in storage until, uh, I'm sorry, it's not in storage until it's read by the intended recipient. Uh, 
meaning in, I can send it, it can sit on a server, it's not moving, but it's still subject to Title I, the Wiretap Act, because the person hasn't read it. There are some Ninth Circuit cases that say the opposite, which say as soon as it stops anywhere on the wire, as it's traveling, it's in storage and is not subject to the Wiretap Act. So the first challenge is the 12 two-party consent laws we talked about earlier, all are wiretap laws. So when you're dealing with that, um, one of the ways to try to avoid them, if you can, is to try to only look at things that are in storage, um, particularly electronic things if these laws cover them. The challenge with cloud is, and I'll use Facebook as an example because it's um, been litigated a lot, there's two different types of providers under ECFA, ECS and RCS, and without boring everyone to death, an ECS is really the person that provides the connectivity or the pipe. An RCS is a remote computing service, and that is more of like a cloud provider. So if you're letting me process data, save data in a cloud, um, that's really an RCS function. So in Facebook, the easiest way to think of it, Facebook messaging, that's a classic sort of ECS, ISP type service. My Facebook wall is a classic RCS type service because I'm storing stuff in the cloud, people are looking at it. And so all of this is probably not that interesting, but what it, what it is is the backdrop for all of these data export issues you're dealing with because, frankly, ECPA itself applies vastly different rules to something that's in storage versus in transit versus with an ECS versus with an RCS. So what laws apply and what portions of these laws apply may depend on the type of service you're providing even if it's the same company. So Facebook will be subject to a variety of different pieces of ECBA depending on what function it's, it's really providing or service it's providing to people. And so when we're doing cloud, the reality is you may trigger both. You might be the connectivity to the cloud and so you're both an ECS and an RCS. And when the government, like they did with Microsoft, can come in and say, gee, we'd like to look at that stuff right there, really depends on if you're an ECS or an RCS because um, there's, as I said, very different rules. Uh, I think Microsoft has seen privacy as a way to differentiate itself in the marketplace. And I think part of, I have to suspect, they knew they were probably not gonna win their possession, custody, or control argument, particularly under ECPA, um, with that. But they are definitely trying to stake out a position to say, we will do whatever we can to fight these type of requests. And so um, <clears throat> what you're gonna see is, as, as data continues to move around the globe, and we have, at best, a murky picture even in the US, there's going to be just a variety of inconsistent holdings floating out around out there depending on what the service you're even dealing with is. That was very helpful and there was a lot of content there. I just want to rewind you a little bit. Uh, earlier, earlier in what you were saying, you talked about the FTC assessments. Can you explain in your experience how rigorous those have been? Um, they're a nightmare. <laughs> uh, I mean for, so I've done, for better, I've, I've done uh, CVS Caremark, which is the largest company to ever get one. So it's a Fortune 20 with 7,500 retail locations, and I've done several of these in the technology space. And what I'd say is if you're a mid-sized technology company, um, you're going to spend probably one to two million a year every other year for 20 years doing your assessments, dealing with this, having to um, run new products by the Federal Trade Commission. So when I have clients under order, we can't just simply say, oh, gee, we're going to do this really new cool thing. and Here's how we're gonna deal with the data that we already have. Most of the time I'm on the phone with the FTC saying, you know, here's what we'd like to do, what do you think? Um, if, it's, if it's an aggressive data use. For a big company, you know, Fortune 50, you're looking at spot probably spending between 10 to 20 million a year for the first couple years, uh, and then that'll ramp down. But it's, these are very expensive orders. Someone's gotta come in and basically do a Sarbanes-Oxley type audit on data security and say, what you do is reasonable. So they have to look at everything. And they will look at everything because they report directly to the commission. Their report comes to the client first, but we have no ability to really edit it. It goes straight to the commission. So it's a, it's a pretty difficult and brutal process. So the take home here is to avoid getting in the crosshairs of the FTC. Jim, now I'd like to invite you to dive yeah. into the cloud. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, before I dive into the cloud, let me right. talk about one way to avoid the crosshairs of the great. FTC. And you had mentioned earlier, Eric, about the representations. There's a very common um, sort of theme of privacy policy that goes through the evolution of a business. And a lot of the clients that we deal with, small startups, do want to have that you know, consumer good feeling. We won't share anything with any third parties. You know, we have great security. 
And the common question you always ask is, well, you say you don't want to share anything with anybody right now. You're not going to share any consumer data or customer data with third parties. What about when you're, you have zero customers in your database now? What about when you have a million, mm -hmm. right? And then you start thinking, hey, um, there's ways to monetize uh, this and there's ways to serve this cu these customers. So uh, back to the misrepresentations, the more, you know, you should periodically review the representations that are made on the website with respect to product descriptions, in the terms of use, in the privacy policies, in SEC filings, to make sure that what's being said is actually matching what the business is doing, because the business is always coming up with more innovative and creative ways to serve the customer, and sometimes those don't always per fit perfectly with what was said at some point prior. So those uh, periodic uh, visits, I think, are useful. With respect to the cloud, um, I think the cloud is sort of uh, easy in some ways and really hard in others. And I was talking to a colleague of mine about this presentation. He said, well, to me, the cloud is just a fancy word for outsourcing, right? It's just outsourcing. And so just everything you do, thinking about uh, outsourcing to a partner and having the right um, requirements in the contract to abide by law and abide by your privacy policy and indemnity and risk allocation provisions and you know, don't let the limitation of liability cover the things that you're trying to get indemnified. All those things, you know, it's just outsourcing, so it's easy that way. I think where it's hard is there's a no, there's not a one size fits all um, for the cloud. And so, um, you know, what type of business do you have? What type of cloud are you considering? Um, the same colleague I was talking to was saying, well, if there's a hacker in Romania, you know, they're not going to hack some mom and pop shop that has a server in their house, right? They're gonna be hacking some big cloud service provider. So that would mean if you got a small business, just keep all your stuff to yourself and, and that'll be the best way to keep it secure. But then if you look at a mid-sized company, you know, that has a consumer facing product, that mid-sized company isn't in the business of um, protecting data and cloud service providers are better at protecting data. Than, than a lot of mid-sized companies. And so you really have to look at, you know, what sort of data am I collecting? Um, what, what sort of cloud am I considering? You know, but then go through those risk allocation issues with respect to, um, to the cloud service agreement. Um, let's see, there's one other. Oh, uh, one really important consideration with respect to the cloud is e-discovery. Uh, I think at the beginning, uh, you need to consider what sort of e-discovery product the cloud service provider is offering and whether you're going to take advantage of it. I've had it come up several times in litigation where um, either the e-discovery tool wasn't enabled and there was some question about whether or not um, the cloud service provider could help us honor our obligations to produce documents, um, but also the cost involved. You know, oftentimes the cost to enable the e-discovery or the cloud service provider's e-discovery tools is really expensive and may actually make you decide not to use that cloud service provider if you think there's a reasonable chance you're going to have to produce uh, information in litigation because you may, it may be cheaper just to do it yourself. So let's talk about you know, when service providers can and will or won't share data. Jim, you want to kick it off? Yeah, so um, this was, we, we sort of followed the questions that were in um, the program. And we had a little bit of an argument about what service providers mean. And I'm going to take service providers to mean partners. So this is somebody that you're co-branding with or you're doing lead generation with or they're marketing for you. And this is another place where you want to make sure that you're not creating misrepresentations that plaintiffs can come after you about later with respect to your data collection policies. So um, there's several steps as best practices that I'd recommend. First. Make sure in your contracts with partners that those partners have to abide by the same requirements you do with respect to privacy um, and compliance with law. Back those up with indemnity and risk allocations or insurance if they're, if they're too small to, do, uh, to back things up with indemnity. Exclude those restrictions from damage caps. Think about using audit and reporting provisions that will allow you to come in and um, test the representations that are made and enforce violations to prove that there's teeth to your policies. A lot of times in litigation over data collection, um, it's as much about having a consistent theme that you can tell as what actually happened with the data. So if you're able to demonstrate, look, uh, 
We made a representation in our policy. We extended that representation in our contract with our partners. When we heard that there were violations, we actually you know, terminated those contracts or you know, had some sort of enforcement mechanism. Uh, that's always better in litigation than knowing about violations and ignoring them or not having a policy in place. And um, so I would, you know, having policies that you actually enforce are, are quite important. And I took the interpretation of service provider to mean ISPs. And in my experience, ISPs don't routinely share their customer data uh, without consent. So first, if there's a request made, they'll seek consent from the customer. Um, and they th the ISP will take the position that, and frankly also, you know, they would require a lawful subpoena to obtain the information. They'll give notice to the customer. The customer then has the opportunity to move to quash the subpoena within a certain amount of time. And if that doesn't occur, then the information will be released. Uh, of course, if there is a motion to quash the subpoena uh, filed, then there's going to be litigation over that particular uh, potential release, shall we say. Uh, Andy, what did you? And I'll, uh, and I'll, I guess, cover both uh, quickly. So, <laughs> if, if now that I, now that we have Snowden, the one good thing for for me is at least we all know what metadata is. It, so, um, under ECBA, there's a line drawn between what I'll call metadata and content. And so, it, it has long been the law, for better or worse. And Snowden, it's part of the reason the Snowden stuff. I mean, some of it's surprising, some of it's not. Um, the government hasn't even needed a warrant. U.S. attorney has not needed a warrant to get metadata in the Ninth Circuit for years. They can go in and get that straight from uh, the traditional ISP uh, that can include who you've been emailing, the size of the files, the name of the files. Content is a different matter. They do need additional process. And one thing just to keep in mind on the litigation front, and it's something that has been an issue that some companies were better about enforcing than others, there is no civil subpoena exception to ECPA which means if I'm in litigation and I want to go subpoena Jim's emails, I cannot get them from an ISP. They cannot do it. They won't do it anymore. Uh, some of them would play around a little bit, but they cannot give you content. What you have to do is somehow get an argument to say that it's in his possession, custody, or control, send him a document request and try to force him to go get them. So one thing that ISPs will never do is give you content at this point if you're a civil litigant. On the broader sense, sort of, of service providers as partners, I've seen the um, FTC in particular be very aggressive about um, making sure that the company that's under consent decree is enforcing its own policies through a vendor assessment program or a VAP, as we would call it, to make sure that there's adequate things done to vet these vendors, and then also have exactly the type of auditing and uh, you know termination provisions that you'd want to see. So I have seen them be very aggressive. I've seen them try to push, in essence, the consent decrees and the privacy side of the world down to our third-party vendors in kind of a flow-through way. So I think that's only going to uh, become more of an issue as the FTC sort of gets more aggressive in the space. Well, I'm pleased to say, by the way, that our, our train is running on time. <laughs> <laughs> we're moving through. We actually blocked off you know, specific minutes for each subtopic, and we're actually a little bit ahead of schedule. So start thinking of your questions for the end. Um, a big topic in this area, obviously, is spoliation. You know, when, when can you get into real trouble, especially in civil lit litigation, is when there's been a claim that's proven of a spoliation where data goes missing that shouldn't have. And of course, you can have practices in place that allow you to retain and also to get rid of you know, uh, data over specified time periods uh, so long as you're not required uh, as a matter of law to retain certain categories of information. But all of that changes once a company is aware of litigation or potential litigation on uh, particular issues. So even if you otherwise could legitimately destroy certain data and not retain it under your usual scheme, once you know that data is relevant to issues raised by potential or actual litigation, that the game changes. And it's, it's, a, it's almost become a you know, whole separate track of litigation in some cases. Uh, I've certainly found that, where the attorneys are not only uh, eyeing toward uh, seeking to find out you know, the merits of the case, but also you know, what is missing and should have been preserved. And I had one case that uh, I had a three-month jury trial about five years ago. And so many of the questions from the opposing attorney in terms of cross-examining my witnesses was, well, where is this data? Where is this information? How come nobody's speaking to this issue? And we had to constantly come back and establish 
that it never existed in the first place. And luckily, maybe not luckily, professionally, we satisfied the jury and we won the case, but it's a, it's a big distraction. And as you might know, uh, if spoliation is established, the potential sanctions can run from the minimal to the extreme. You can have monetary sanctions, which can be small to extremely large in the many millions of dollars. You can have issues decided against your client or your company, I should say, uh, where there's information that uh, should have been produced that wasn't provided. It will be established as a matter of fact, adverse to the company, even if the information would have potentially shown it the other way. And then, of course, you can have case ending sanctions, terminating sanctions, where a judge is dissatisfied enough that basically your case is over for failure to play the game properly uh, in litigation. So uh, that's pretty sobering. And why don't I turn it over to my colleagues so they can add further paint to this particular. Yeah, I think as a, as a best practice, I'd say having a litigation hold, uh, as soon as you know there's an issue that might give rise to a duty to preserve, and to make sure that that litigation hold gets to the right folks. Exactly. And also that there's um, some way to terminate the litigation hold, because we've talked about when, you know, do, ha taking a data minimization approach as a policy. So you also want to clear those data holds or the litigation holds when the litigation ends. And um, I echo Eric's comments. The, the missing document is always worse than explaining away a document. And it's always more fun on the other side to have a missing document <laughs> than to have to argue about what a document means. And that's because if the document's missing, the argument isn't about what's in it and what it says, good or bad. The argument's about why it's missing and putting a black hat on the opponent or trying to take it off, uh, trying to take the black hat off if you're the one with the missing document. Um, so yeah, there's, it's a good, good thing to avoid. Yeah. No, I, I think that's right. And look, most of the cases that end up getting litigated aren't ones where there's a document that says, oh, we're in direct breach of this contract and we owe them you know, X million dollars. Those cases don't make it to the complaint stage usually, let alone trial. And so what you're always talking about is some document that is certainly not nearly as bad as that, that somehow didn't get produced, that then becomes as bad or worse than that document. And so it just uh, echo what Eric said, which is there's no one document that's you know, bad enough that it shouldn't be produced. It's unethical, and it, it always creates issues for the company. Right, and then we have to deal with the roles between you know, outside counsel, inside counsel, the client. You know, it's not appropriate, in my view, for a law firm, for example, to completely delegate uh, you know, litigation hold and you know, collecting data pertaining to a lawsuit uh, because sometimes companies don't see that as their critical mission. Their critical mission is going about their business. So the law firm has to be involved, uh, but law firms can be expensive. So there's also some role, of course, of the people you know, inside the company and, and working together. And there needs to be very clear and crisp communication. There needs to be point people, like a particular point person within the law firm, point person within the company. They need to be dealing with each other directly and actively uh, because also you want to avoid a situation which came up in a, a pretty well-known case around here where their finger is being pointed after the fact. Uh, where the e-discovery didn't work out correctly and law firm is saying, wasn't my problem, company didn't cooperate with us, company is saying law firm didn't get it right, and that's not a, that's not a place where you want to go. Uh, any further comments on this topic? I don't think so. We have, we have time for questions, or uh, I took it upon myself in com communication with these guys to be the scribe for our list of uh, recommended best practices. And I can go through that list, or and they can add on, or if, if there's questions, we'll entertain those now as well. I think that list is important, so why don't we do that? Yeah. Uh, right now, we have about 12 minutes left. If you could maybe save a few minutes at the end, unless yeah. there aren't any questions. Um, then I'll filibuster. It's all, it's all yours. <laughs> so with respect to what documents um, a company should collect and retain, I think our consensus was companies should have a need-based plan that uh, keeps documents that are needed for the business and minimizes retention of what isn't needed. And that's not an easy process, but to, but to step through that process. And it's not easy because oftentimes the data collection is so dispersed among the company or driven by um, marketing or departments other than legal. But to have that need-based plan, 
to have a data creation policy so that employees are aware of uh, sort of a parade of horribles that can happen if you create um, data that has damaging information in it and to protect uh, protect um, efforts to get advice under the attorney-client privilege when you can. With respect to litigation-specific risks in the U.S., uh, review statutory damages cases. Uh, be aware of what types of cases can be made based on data collection. Make sure that the representations that are made on the website and privacy policies and SEC filings align with the reality. With respect to data retention in light of overseas issues, uh, consider uh, how to set up, uh, well, consider the prospect of international e-discovery and whether there are technical or business issues that should um, be implemented to prevent uh, overseas access. Don't assume U.S. privilege law applies, especially to in-house counsel communications. <laughs> With respect to the cloud, consider risk allocation issues in the cloud and why your particular business might uh, need or not need cloud services. Consider e-discovery tools from cloud service providers. And then finally, with respect to service providers, uh, make sure that they are required to comply with representations that you've made to customers and that there's risk allocations with those, with those partners. Anything I missed? That was very efficient. <laughs> so we now have 10 minutes for questions. You can ask anything you want, including where you think LeBron James is going to end up next year. <laughs> What's going to happen to the well, Miami Heat? Uh, yes, over there. I was just wondering, um, I, I hear kind of, you know, I hear that most companies are actually, oh, nobody's leading anything, right? I mean, have you guys actually worked with companies who are actually leading stuff? Is that, is that what's happening, or is that kind of like five minutes? So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I think, um, yes, we are working with companies that are doing data minimization and going through that step. I think the hurdle is getting to the assessment, doing a privacy assessment. It's, it's not an easy thing to do, and it's expensive, and I think there's a knee-jerk reaction to say, well, we hope we're not the poster child, you know, and we'll sort of do the best we can. Um, but there's no, it's, it's hard, I think, to... Um, impress upon a business, impress upon the decision makers why it's really, really valuable to actually go through the steps of deciding what to keep and what not to keep. Once you get to that phase of somebody saying, yes, because of data breach risks or because we want to be seen as somebody who value, who is creating a trust relationship with our customers, you know, we are going to do this privacy assessment and make sure we sort of know where the data is and, and why we're keeping what we're keeping and why we're getting rid of what we're getting rid of. I think when you're at that stage, you know, which is, a, I think, a relatively few number of companies, yes, that we're doing data minimization. I think that program is worthwhile. Like he says, it is expensive. And there are some companies that are fearful because they don't want to be found to have uh, engaged in spoliation of information. So there has to be a real concerted effort to retain what really needs to be retained, whether it's required by law, you know, regulation, uh, or the potential or actual litigation, and, and then otherwise getting rid of information that's just unneeded and has its own expense just because it's hanging around and has to be dealt with and managed. We should have let you start. You just said you did one of the biggest privacy assessments in history. So <laughs> yeah, I, sorry, the answer is, if it's okay. Um, yeah, companies are deleting. And, and part of it is you don't want to have to go to your regulator and say, yeah, we have this data from 10 years ago that you know we have no business reason to keep. So um, I, I would say that I, I see it more in what I'll call the heavily regulated industries. There's much more maturity around the privacy program. So I, I do see it there. I see it candidly less probably with um, what I'll say are the pure technology companies whose view is we keep everything and then we'll figure out what we do with it later at times. So I think it's, it's kind of taking some of these best practices from um, other more heavily regulated industries and saying, okay, how can we apply that in a way that doesn't stifle creativity but reduces risk for the company? Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, and you know, one thing, the other model that's out there, I mean, part of, um, I think it's on my, my bio you have, I work a lot with the Naval Postgraduate School with their school called the Center for Asymmetric Warfare, which basically sort of looks at information theory. And, and the ones who, you know, putting Snowden aside and who had, you know, access to classified data, the people that really know how to do this right is, frankly, the intelligence community. Their entire model is looking at the sensitivity of data, then basing who gets access, how long it's kept, you know, how we protect it, all these things tear off of data sensitivity. And I think that's the one, you know, takeaway from my side would be as a best practice is not all data is the same. So how you treat very sensitive data is and, and very likely will be much different than how you treat non-sensitive data. And so if you want to sort of start this process in a little, you know, narrower way, part of it is the key part to me of the privacy impact assessment you do is looking at where the most sensitive data is for your company or for consumers and starting with that. Yeah, and I, I also, uh, you know, I talked earlier about the tension of keeping stuff because it, there might be a use for it later. So last year, 2013, I got an email from Amazon about a CD I had purchased in 2006. It said, oh, you purchased, you know, this, this CD, you know, how about some other, other people like these things? How about buying this? So that was, you know, that was an example of somebody who kept, I, I was frankly surprised that for, you know, uh, seven years, this. Yeah. Yeah. So that was an example of somebody, you know, if, if one of their competitors said, well, we don't need to keep the data, Jim buying the CD. Now that was sensitive data in my mind because it was a, a Kenny Loggins CD I bought for my wife. I was <laughs> frankly a little embarrassed that they still knew that I had purchased that. <laughs> Sure it was. Yes. <laughs> had you not been on Amazon in six or seven years and they were reaching back to no, get No, I had been. I were frequent shoppers. Yeah. yeah. So a few more minutes left. Any uh, further questions for my colleagues? Yes, please. the risk allocation you How successful, you know, my company's not particularly We're talking about I think it's getting much more difficult now that cloud services are sort of concentrated. Um, it's almost a contract of adhesion. It's hard to, um, you know, change those provisions, and it depends on what sort of leverage you have. But I, I think it's increasingly difficult. But it also is part of the consideration of whether to move things to the cloud if you don't, if you can't get those sorts of provisions. Other questions? All right, well, I'm pleased to say that we finished three minutes under budget, so it's always good to be under budget. Uh, thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the comments of Jim and Andy. Uh, like we were told to tell you, uh, please do your online evaluations, and uh, we'll stay around for a few more minutes if you have any individual questions. Thank you. Thanks.